I'm surrounded by girls who are slipping on the floor and yelling at each other. I'm at a party. And I'm standing at the drinks table and I'm hitting on this blonde chick who was kind of a friend of mine. She was, she kind of hang around with the larger friend group that I was hanging out with at the time. So I'm hitting on her and stuff and it's not really going anywhere. But instead of telling me, oh, Johnny, piss off, man, you're fucking, you're wasted a bit. Instead, she looks at me and she says, oh, Johnny, uh, so-and-so wants to kiss you at midnight because it was a New Year's party. And I'm like, bad, man. I'm like, so up until midnight, I was talking to that girl, that the girl that she was talking about. We were sitting next to each other, you know, tension's building, you know, I'm trying to like flirt with her a bit, you know, my hand was like on her leg a bit, you know, like usual degenerate party flirting, you know. And when midnight comes, we're sitting next to each other. We're on this couch, right on the like darker side of the room. So it's a bit more, you know, you know, more dark, more like romantic. And that. I mean, I guess it's not romantic, man. You can't be romantic at a party when everyone's like drinking it up, man. But, but you know what I'm saying? There was like an atmosphere there to it. Dude. But we're sitting next to each other and midnight comes and we do it, man. We, we kiss each other. And I was getting hyped, man, because, you know, it was midnight. Everyone's like, you know, kazooing it up. Everyone's young, you know. I, I, I was getting hyped, man. I was, I was happy, man. I was a happy guy. But I remember throughout the night looking at my one buddy who he doesn't really drink so he was kind of just you know sitting on the couch you know taking it easy not really you know getting as dumb and, and stupid as the rest of us were but i remember just throughout the night looking at him and maybe a day after a few days after the party thinking back and be like man i feel i feel bad for the guy not because he wasn't drinking and he wasn't you know sharing this fun time that the rest of us were having but because the day before that party me and him me and that buddy we're hanging out around my town, you know, doing laps around the town, just walking on the sidewalk, having, you know, deep conversation. And the topic comes up about girls. And I'm like, dude, man, you got any girls you're looking out for? What's going on, dude? And he's like, oh, well, there's this one girl that I'm crushing on, you know. And, and it was a girl that was going at the party the next day that we were both going to. So I said, hey, man, you got to make a move. You got to do something tomorrow, man. You got to try something out. And he's like, okay, you know, I'll see. I'll see what I can do. That girl was a girl that I kissed for that whole night, man. After I had that conversation with the blonde, I, that whole night, I was flirting with her, talking with her, sitting next to her, and then I kissed her. Knowing full well that the day before, my buddy told me that he was trying to go for her. And I didn't ask him. I didn't say, hey man, is this cool? You know, she, she's interested in me. Can I do it? I didn't ask him. I just did it, man. If you can't control your lust, if you don't have authority over your lust and your desires, you might lose friends. You might lose your future wife. You might lose God. You might lose out on your life, man. My name is Johnny Self-Improvement, and this is my full guide to overcoming lust. Let's get into this. Part one, porn. The summer of 2021 was the worst period of my life. I was the most depressed I've ever been. I was the loneliest I've ever been. And it was a time where I really, I was the loneliest I've ever been because, not just because of the pandemic lockdown and all that, you know, communist BS. I was the loneliest I've ever been because I realized all the friends I had at school were just friends with me because of circumstance. We weren't friends because, oh, you know, we're buddies and we like each other, whatever. We were friends because we just went to the same school and that's just how it went. And I really only stayed in touch with two people that I was friends with before. One guy and one girl. And that one girl, she had a... I, I was crushing on her and stuff, but she was, you know, talking to other guys during this time, so I wasn't really going any, anywhere with that. But she had a friend. Not only did she have a friend, she had a friend who was blonde. And I was so desperate, man. Like you, like you watch my videos now, man, and you're like, oh, you know, another dating story. Oh, Johnny messed up a first date again. What's going on here, man? This guy's desperate as hell. But buddy, this was my peak of desperation this time right here. I was watching all the red pill videos, all those like dark game, like manipulation type videos and stuff, like messed up stuff, man, that I was trying to use to get girls to like me on Snapchat. And, and this was at the height of my porn addiction, man. Like when I talk about my no fat videos, like, oh, you know, three times a day, like that time when, like th this was that time, dude. This was that time, man. But that one girl who had a, a blonde friend that I was talking about, that blonde friend, I got her Snapchat and we were, you know, snapping, you know, pretty regularly, actually, like probably a few times a day, man. And to me, that was freaking, that was huge, man. That was everything to me. And I was trying to make something happen, man. I was trying to make something work here. Even though I was, you know, fucking with this weird as hell guy, just, cooped up in his house doing weird shit, dude. And I forget how it happened, man. But one night we were snapping each other and I asked her for nudes and she said no. Cause you know, she's not a whore or whatever, you know, but she said no. And I kept snapping her, kept asking her, you know, again and again, over and over. She kept snapping back saying no, but I kept asking. 
the point of this story is porn doesn't relieve sexual desire at the height of my porn addiction i wasn't less lustful in my life because you know i was getting all my lust out through porn i was the most lustful i did like what i just said man one of the biggest regrets that i have when it comes to the way i've treated women you know porn doesn't relieve sexual desire it reinforces it sin doesn't prevent sin i was talking to the pastor at my church once and and he, he's the man i look up to the guy and stuff but he was telling me this analogy he said he said johnny if i was at the doctor's and the doctor told me look man if you have one sip of tim horton's coffee you're gonna die and then the next week you saw me at tim horton's holding a coffee you, you'd run up to me and be like hey pastor what are you doing man what are you doing and then i looked at you and i said oh no no, no. i'm not gonna drink it i'm just gonna I'm just going to smell it. I'm just going to take a sip and just swish it around my mouth and then spit it out. You look at me and tell me I'm insane. And I started laughing, man, because I, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Porn doesn't work to let out our sexual desire or lust. Maybe to some people it does, man. I don't, I don't know. Maybe to some people it does, man, but not us. Not us. And I don't, I don't think anybody really, man. Because how are you going to say, oh, I'm going to be less lustful because I'm doing diet lust over here. How are you going to say, oh, no, I'm not going to, you know, make out with random girls at parties and, you know, try to view women sexually and all this and use chicks and all this when I'm using them sexually over here. That's a huge trap that you can fall into because that's what the that's what the modern media says, man. That's like the politically correct view, the kind of liberal kind of view of things where it's like, oh, you know, porn is normal. You know, you're just laying it out. I was watching Joe Rogan, man, and I. Like, I love Rogan, man, but he was, I don't know, dude. I didn't like when he said this, man. He was giving an example. He was talking to Theo Vaughn on his podcast, and he was giving an example. If you imagine one guy who doesn't watch porn and stuff, and then he goes into, like, relationships being really desperate and wanting sex and stuff. Or if you imagine another guy who watches porn here and there and stuff to get it out of his system, and then he's not as desperate when he goes into relationships. And he's not so desperate for sex. And that sounds like that sounds like it makes sense, man. It make it like it sounds like it makes sense on paper, but that's not how it works, dude. So how do we fight this temptation? How do we fight temptation for lust in general? Well, the situation that I would find myself in was I'd be doing something random, like I'd be cooking food, or I'd be I'd be on YouTube Shorts, and I would see something, and I'd get the thought, get the idea to go watch porn or go do something, right? And then for the next like few hours of my day, I'd be you know eating, or I'd be in the shower, I'd be doing stuff, and then I'd, like I'd, the thought would continue, and it would just grow and grow from there until then that night, then you know the devil comes on you. But I found a two-step framework that you can use for fighting any type of lust. But for this part, we'll stick to nofap. And I'm going to use this framework for the rest of the guide. If we imagine how temptation works, what has to happen for us to fall into temptation? Well, first you get the thought for porn. You know, you get the thought, oh, I could watch porn right now. Then you indulge in that thought. And then you get, you know, some type of satisfaction, some type of dopamine hit from, you know, indulging in that thought. Like, oh, this, this could be good, man. And then you start feeling like, really attracted to it like you really want to do this now and then you choose to do it you have your free will you choose to do it and then you sin our best bet for stopping temptation for overcoming lust is to stop it at the thought or to prevent the thought in the first place so my first step that i'm going to give you right now is to write down a list of all your hot triggers what triggers you into watching porn and you can do this for other types of lust that we will talk about in the rest of this video but what has to happen for you to watch porn and you can think back to, you know, times you relapse, what, what caused it and stuff, or you can, you know, save this list on your notes app so then next time you relapse or next time something happens, you can write it down. And with that list, we can do two things. And the first one is prevent. One of the biggest ways that you can prevent temptation, the biggest ways you can prevent yourself from watching porn is clearing your environment by getting rid of social media, getting rid of Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube watching. Because if you think of all the triggers, like, I don't know, like, I don't know about you, man, what you wrote on your list, but... For me, man, the majority of my triggers for watching porn is seeing a, a chick on Instagram, seeing someone a, on a story, seeing a, a, a snap that someone sends me, seeing a post of some chick, and it's it's all it's social media. It's like TikTok, man. I've never I never had TikTok, but from what I hear, man, from what people have been telling me, it's like softcore porn. Because you see like re-uploaded TikToks on YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels when I had Instagram, you'd see them, and it's it's insane what what's going on and how sexually provocative. It is. And then you're watching that, you know, half the day. And then you're wondering why you can't stop watching porn, man. Because it's being fed to you. Because you're being triggered by it repeatedly every day. 
It's like if you were walking in the park and you saw some guy giving away free pizza. You might not have went out of your way that day to go buy pizza, but now that you see this guy's, you know, giving it for free and he's, he's here, you know, and you're here, you're like, you know, fuck it, man, I'll have a slice, dude. When the offer is being presented to you constantly, that's a constant trigger to, to relapse. So to deal with those triggers, number one is to prevent, and the biggest way you can prevent those triggers is getting rid of social media. But the second thing you can do, because not all those triggers you can prevent. Like if you see a, a hot girl is in your class, you can't prevent that. You can't like, you know, take her out of the class. You're like, you, you can't get rid of that, right? So what do we do for the ones we can't prevent? We do, number two, prepare. Make game plans. You, you can write this down below your hot triggers. If I see slash feel X, I'm gonna do Y. I'll give you an example right here, man. For the social media example, if you're still, you know, on YouTube Shorts or you're on Instagram Reels and you're, you know, progressing to get rid of social media, but you're still on it for the time being, one easy thing you can do for when you see a lustful or sexual post, what you can do is what game plan you can have is if you see that, even if you watch it, man, even if you lust it out and you watch it, what you can do is if you're on YouTube Shorts, you can press those three dots and press do not recommend me this channel anymore. You can press that button. And from then on, you won't see posts from the, that channel, from a channel that posts sexual and lustful content. And that's a quick thing that takes two seconds that you can do if you see a lustful post. And you can do the same thing for the equivalent of that button for Instagram, whether it's block or don't show me this, whatever, don't recommend me this, whatever it is. And for the other triggers on your list, you can do the exact same thing. You can make game plans for them. So when they do come, because eventually, shit's gonna happen right then you have a plan and then even if you don't do it perfectly even if you don't do it every single time at least now you have a plan and you can keep that in mind all right part two visual slash in person you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery but i tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart so my quick story for this part of the guide is Okay, so I'm sitting in the cafeteria of my school, eating my almonds, trying to get my protein in at lunch. And I'm sitting with my friend group and my uh, buddy's girlfriend is sitting across me. She's also, you know, a really close friend of mine. And a friend of hers, you know, a girl, walks up to go talk to her about some, you know, BS planning prom. And this girl that walks up to her is wearing like um, a crop top, right? Those shirts with the, you know, the stomach part cut off so you can see like the stomach area and all that. And she's, you know, talking away, saying whatever. And I'm just, just staring at her stomach i guess dude i'm just staring at her body right and i'm not even like trying to hide like i'm just out in the open what was effed up about it effed up I, i'm trying to stop swearing in my videos dude because well one i'm trying to stop swearing because just in general in life but also because of monetization dude youtube is freaking there you go freaking is hard it's freaking hard on the f word dude for like putting ads on videos and stuff so i'm trying to like because i just got monetized dude you know you know what i'm saying you know you know turn up but Dude, when I read the damn, like, like the guidelines, because I did look at it previously before, but I didn't really like give a, give a F about it. It just it sounds so much like a, like a bitch. I don't want to, I don't know, dude. Saying like, a, oh, that's so effed up. It sounds so cringe, dude. I don't know. Because I don't want to like bleep at all the videos. That's just weird to me. I'm going to start saying either frick or, or just, I don't know, use alternative language. I don't, anyway, dude, the, the messed up part about it was I wanted her to see me do it which sounds kind of like, oh, what, the, what are you talking about? It was almost like a weird way of flirting while I was like trying to like let her know that, oh, I'm attracted to her. Even though I, like, I didn't want a relationship with her, I didn't want to go out with her. I was just, you know, having a good time, I guess. And I wanted her to lust back for me. But what ended up happening was she didn't look at me. She didn't like look over and like see me looking at her or whatever. This is what happened, man. She was talking and then she, I think subconsciously, or maybe purposely, I don't know, took her shirt and was kind of like like pulling it down. You know, you can't, you can't see, but like kind of like pulling it down, right? The shirt wasn't going down any further, man. Not, it, nothing was getting more covered up. But, but that's why I think it was like a subconscious thing where she could feel that she was being looked at in this way. And she felt uncomfortable, I think. And then that was, you know, trying to cover up. And then after she did that, I just was like, ah, oh, dude, I felt horrible, dude. Because I purposely lusted after her and made her feel like shit because I couldn't control my own desires. And that brings us to this part of the guide, which is about visual lusting or like in-person lusting. But first, before we can deal with this type of lust, we have to know the difference between lusting and noticing. Because I think desiring an attractive girl or thinking a girl is attractive or looks good, I don't think that's lust. What lust is, I think, is staring at her or, you know, staring at her body or tits or ass or, you know, fantasizing about her or, you know, slapping your buddy next to you, like pointing, like, like check this out. That, that's lust. My definition of lust is reducing someone, in this case, reducing a woman, because you know, 
reducing a woman from a woman made in the image of God, reducing her to whatever effed up purposes you have for her. Damn it, dude. Give me the one, man. I, I think I can say it like once or a few times in the video. I, I'm not sure. But it's reducing a woman to what you can do with her, what you can get out of her, instead of seeing her as a person, a human, you know, made in the image of God. And it's important to know that difference because, you know, it seems kind of obvious. Like, obviously, the thing that a girl is attractive, that's not a bad thing, right? That's just a natural um, reaction. But what started happening for me during my initial stage of fighting lust and overcoming lust on, uh, you know, the war on lust is, that's what I called it. My initial stages of that, I was, like, I was just getting so like neurotic about it where I'd be in class and a girl would walk in, you know, it'd be the beginning of class, a girl would walk in and I'll just, you know, look up just, you know, naturally because someone's, there was a person over there moving, you just look up naturally. And then I'd be like berating myself, oh, you shouldn't have done that, you don't do it, like look down, look down, don't, don't look, don't look. And you can only do that for so long before you start going insane, man. That's kind of what I was doing. Because as a man, as a young man, you know, as a young guy, you're gonna find women attractive. That's just, that's just how it goes. That's just your biology, you know? The difference is what you do with it. The difference is, do you take that natural reaction and that, you know, good thing, you know, desiring another person, do you take that and then twist it? and then decide to fantasize about them in these lustful ways or decide to stare at them, make them feel uncomfortable, or use them for whatever effed up purposes in your own head. So I'd say watch out for that. Watch out for the difference between lusting, reducing a woman to whatever you can get out of her, and the difference between that and noticing. You know, noticing an attractive, good-looking, beautiful, hot girl over there. For this part, I'm gonna give you three methods that you can use to overcome this visual lust or whatever you want to call it. And the first method is by far the best one. Like this is the most recent one that I found in my, you know, quest or my journey to overcome lust. It was the last one that I found and it works the best. I love this method, man. And method one is eye contact. Oh, Johnny, what are you talking about? What I mean is when you catch yourself lusting for a girl, you know, let's say you're looking at her ass or whatever. When you catch yourself, instead of, you know, looking away and, you know, freaking out on yourself, instead just move your eyes, the direction of your eyes, from whatever part you're looking at to her eyes. Make eye contact with her. Even if she's not making eye contact back with you and she's looking at whatever or she's talking to somebody, just look at her eyes. And that sounds so deficiently simple, dude. Just like look at her eyes. How does that help with anything? But this works on multiple levels, dude. Let me let me let me tell you this, dude. So when you do that, when you move from lusting to holding eye contact, what you're doing is one, you're stopping yourself from staring at her body because you're looking at her eyes. So that's good. Two, what you're doing is from Looking at her eyes, you go from looking at her body to looking at her as a person. It's like that saying, the eyes are the window to the soul. If you look at her eyes instead, you're seeing her as who she is, as a person, instead of, you know, whatever part you want to reduce her to. And the third one, which is, this is like a pro tip, dude. If you have a big dick, man, you can do this. Pro tip, if she catches you, if you're looking at her eyes and then she, you know, looks back and holds eye contact with you too. What you can do, and this is a big, big move, dude. I honestly, I don't do this much, dude, because I'm kind of like, a, I get nervous in these situations, dude, I'm gonna be honest. But what you can do is you can look at her, keep looking, smile at her, do like a nod, or do like a, do like a, like a, I don't know, do, do some cool shit, dude. Do a smile or something, and then let her look away, and then go on with your day. And then right there, you can like plant a seed. Like if you like this girl, man, you could plant a seed where, you know, if you're at school or if you're, you know, at the gym and you're gonna see her again. Now because of that, now because you had that interaction, now that gives you the opportunity in the future to go up and talk to her and it'll be less awkward and less weird. And then you can start building either a friendship if you're trying to go that route or, you know, a possible relationship. And even if you're like at the mall or somewhere where you're probably not gonna see the girl again, you can do that. You can do that smile at her while she's looking. And if she's like reciprocal of it, then you know you can go walk up to her and then you know, go talk to her, ask for a phone number, and then who knows what can happen. But I don't do that often, dude. I actually wrote in my <laughs> script, dude. Before filming, I had no idea why I wrote this. I wrote in my notes for this part, my bitch instinct to look away, comma, Michael Sarah. And I <laughs> freaking no idea what I was talking about. But I think I was talking about that uh, scene from the movie Superbad with Michael Sarah in it where uh, he's in class and he looks back and he's looking at his crush. I think Rebecca or Becky or something, and he's like staring at her tits and stuff, and then she catches uh, him, and then he's just uh, like, he, like freaks out, he's just pretending like he's like just thinking or you know looking in the distance or some. Sh That's what I do, dude. I'm gonna be honest, man. I'm gonna be honest. But this is my favorite method, also because this is like a fourth point, because you don't have to stop looking at her. If your tactic, if your strategy for overcoming this type of lust is to just look away, if a girl's just you know walking by or you're uh, crossing paths in the hallway or something like that. 
you have two seconds where you're seeing her. So if you lustfully look at her and then look away, like you're gonna do that anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, but the beauty of the eye contact method is you can still appreciate how attractive she is because you can just boost in your mood like that, man. I swear to good looking girls will just like as dudes, man. Like if you see like a like a pretty girl, man, it can just make the rest of your day, man. If we're being honest. And with this method, you can you know you can still look at them and still get that boost to your mood without lusting after them. The second method is breathing. Breathing in the style that David Dieta talks about in the book, The Way of the Superior Man. Breathing also is, sounds like one of those like so like retardedly simple. The rationale behind it is like in meditation, when we use our breath as an anchor to the present moment, we can do the same when we're getting caught in lust. When we're meditating and you know thoughts are getting to us and we wanna get back to the present moment, what we do is we bring it back to our breath. You know, we bring it back to our deep breathing. In the same way, when we catch ourselves lusting, we can just take a few deep breaths and bring ourselves back to the present moment and get ourselves out of our own head where we're fantasizing or doing whatever. And the breathing that David Dieta talks about in his book, it's like a it's like a mental reset. If you, if you haven't read the book, it's like a, the type of breathing that he describes or that he gives instruction to is like a deep belly breathing type of thing. It's like a real like kind of spiritual thing but like kind of like the bro science behind it is when you do that deep belly breathing what you're doing is activating your parasympathetic nervous system which is the part of your nervous system that calms you down it's like the opposite of the fight or flight and when you do that deep belly breathing it's like a mental reset for you it's like um it's like when you walk out of the gym and you're you know you're sore and you just did a, you know a crazy push workout or something and you walk out and you just go you take a deep breath and it's just it's almost like therapeutic in a way, man. We just, ah, you just, you know, you're taking it easier. It's like a mental reset, man. And in the same way, when you're catching yourself lusting, you can do that and just, you know, I don't need it, man. I'm, I'm good. Real quick, you can do this right now if you're not in some public place, man, because it's, it's kind of weird, man. But Or you can just, you know, have a big dick, like I said before, and just do it wherever you are. Put one hand on your stomach and then one hand on your chest and just breathe normally and see which part elevates like is your chest expanding or is your stomach expanding and then what do you want to do if you're more naturally like a chest breather try to breathe through your stomach like expanding your stomach out it's it's difficult to describe man, but try to breathe like as deep as you can as low as you can into your stomach and then breathe it up so like kind of start like expand your lower belly then mid and then like upper abs and then chest and then like all like breathe it up almost it's difficult to describe man it's really something you just got to do you gotta you know get the chapter read the book man but it's something you can easily get better at during practice and it's so simple that's just worth a try and what i usually do is i or i pair this up with the eye contact method the third method the last method of this part is positive visualization this is what hamza talked about in his full guide to discipline where he talks about fighting lust and the idea of it is to when you're feeling lust to recall a positive memory and then visualize it in your head as vividly as you can and what it's supposed to do is you know get you feeling good get you feeling you know grateful and happy and you know looking back at a, a positive memory of you winning a football game or you and your buddies having a good time or you know you and your buddy said something you know hilarious you guys started dying like a good a good time that you can bring yourself back to and then because you're feeling more positive and more grateful you're more likely to be more disciplined that's the idea behind it i don't like this method i'm gonna be honest man this is what i did at first and it, it just really didn't work what happened for me was i'd be in a moment i lost and then i'd like remember this method and i'll be like okay let me think of a, a positive memory or okay this and then i'll like try to visualize that and it would take like one or two minutes for me to like it's, it's kind of hard for me like fully visualize a memory like that so take a couple minutes and then by that time i'm like like i'm in, in class or something and i'm just distracted and i'm like not knowing what the fuck's going on and people are trying to talk to me and i'm just like being that weirdo in a corner just trying to like kind of close his eyes without anybody seeing it's not that convenient and even if like what i started to do was make a positive visualization rolodex so i'd have on my notes my notes app i just have a list of different positive memories you know winning winning the football game or my buddy saying something dumb and all us laughing or uh, getting the first uh, girl's phone number like just positive memories and then writing them down in a list so i don't have to you know come up with one on the spot i have like a list to go to and i can like kind of remember that list in the back of my head but like i said man it's just it's not that convenient and it didn't really work that well for me one good part about it, I guess, is because it takes like a minute or two to fully visualize it vividly, like it gets you distracted enough. So if the girl is there, you're like, you're on your own shit. You're like completely somewhere else in your head. But like I said, it's not that convenient, but you can still try it out and see if it works for you. When it comes to this, when it comes to trying not to look at girls in person and look at their 
bodies and look at their ass and all this stuff. It's so easy to get resentful and go full black pilled on this. You also gotta make sure we're not getting too resentful. Cause it's like I said, it's so easy, man, because because when we're trying our freaking hardest not to treat women in this way, when we're trying our best not to objectify women. Like the common thing you see in the like the YouTube shorts comments is oh, you don't have to objectify women, they'll do it themselves. Like that's a thing you see. I've seen multiple times, man, and it's it's a true statement, man. But it's just that's not the right way of looking at it, I think. We also gotta see the other perspective of it. And that perspective is the devil has infiltrated society. The devil, like social media, modern feminism has infiltrated society to such a level where these young chicks, like girls our age, man, are growing up on Instagram, on Snapchat, and they're getting made to feel that in order to be validated, in order to feel like they're worthy of love and attention and affection, they have to dress promiscuously or they have to dress in a revealing way. And that's the freaking result of modern feminism, man. And like, it's so easy to blame the girls for doing that because they should like, they shouldn't do that. And they shouldn't be stripping online, dude. It's not good for themselves. It's not good for anybody else. But we also got to see that it's not exactly entirely their fault either. The same way it's not entirely our fault that we became addicted to porn, exposed to this at such a young age where we didn't know any fucking better. And we were just like young kids, just, you know, trying to get a quick nut in. Because this is our battle, you know, overcoming lust, we shouldn't blame them. Because e even if they didn't, man, if, even if the culture in our society was, you know, women have to be dressed a certain way and they can't be this revealing. Do, do you think like in the first century AD, people weren't lusting it up? You think in the first century, because the culture was at the time, you know, women gotta be covered up, they gotta, you know, things over their hair and all this stuff. You think guys weren't, you know, looking at chicks out in public back then and, you know, thinking wildness? They probably were, man. They probably freaking were. Even though it's not entirely our fault that, you know, we're lusting after these girls because they're doing it to themselves in a way. It's still our battle to fight. These chicks who are falling prey to modern feminism and social media, they're not the enemy. We know who the real enemy is. I'm not trying to end this part on a dark note like that, man, but here, I'll give you guys some hope, man. After, you know, a couple months of trying to, you know, fight lust, making this my main goal at the semi-formal dance, right, at semis for my school. Um, at the dance where girls are wearing crazy, it's like girls are wearing the tight dresses and, the, you know, the low-cut dress, all that stuff. It's like the prime environment. It's a hotbed for visual lust. But at that point, I've had, you know, some experience, some practice, some discipline. In that period, in that period of time of like, what? And what was it, like six hours or something? I probably looked at girls lustfully like twice. The same girl it was, I remember it, because I remember I was sitting down and I looked over, I looked over twice. I caught myself both times and put a stop to it. But that was it, man. And the like most lustful environment for like six hours, dude. Only two times. And it's not, yeah, it's not perfect, man, but I don't know, man. I, I realized it the next day and I was like, I'm, I was pretty proud of myself, man. It's kind of a cringe thing to be proud of, man, but hey, you take what you get when it comes to this stuff, huh? So it can get better and it does get easier as you go. All right, part three, mental fantasy. I was looking at a Reddit post and it said this, the reason you relapse and can't keep the streak for long is because you have mentally relapsed in your mind before you did it in the physical. And this is the part I added. The reason you tried to make out with some drunk girl at a party, the reason you acted like you really liked the girl just so you could use her, it's because you mentally lusted and mentally used girls before you did it in the physical. All right, the story for this part of the guide. Um, this was one of the first experiences that led me to writing this script and led me to trying to fight lust. Way back in May of last year, I ditched a day of school to go to this school board student council meeting where all the student councils of all the schools in the school board came together at the school board building and I wasn't even part of student council dude they just like my friends were on it and they just asked if I wanted to ditch a day of school but we get there and it's this freaking lib like it was just like liberal headquarters is what it was dude I felt like a I felt so out of place. I felt like a conservative, like spy, like sneaking in, trying to see what the liberals are up to or something, dude. There was a part where, I don't even remember what this was for, but they had a thing on the screen. They were doing a PowerPoint presentation and there was just a long list of the types of like groups you could belong to and that you could be discriminated against. It was like fucking, it was like 50 terms, dude. I'm like, but yeah, most of it was just about, you know, inclusivity, diversity, like equity, all these, you know, communist words, you know what I'm saying? Actually, I remember, I, I have to say this, dude, it was so bad. They were, cause this place is full of like real student council people who like love this stuff. And I'm like this random guy, like out of place, dude, who just doesn't give an F. You know, I'll say it, who doesn't give a fuck. I'll say it, dude, I'll say it. And um, 
we have to do this one icebreaker exercise where the whole like all the student councils and stuff all the people we were mixed up and it had to go to random tables so we're, we were with random people and we had to say what three things we would bring to a deserted island and everybody like everybody everybody was being a complete nerd dude everyone was saying like i'd bring a water filter and a compass and a, like like they're, they're going all full like serious and nerdy on it so i was like okay i'm gonna you know actually break the ice here and say something funny so when we got to the part where people were like raising their hands and the teacher, whatever guy was calling people out, like trying to hear what people were talking about. And I raised my hand and I said, the three things I would bring on a deserted island. I partly stole this from Theo Vaughn. He's like had a similar discussion with Joe Rogan or something. I kind of stole what he said, but I said, uh, I'd bring what a, a picture of my family, a scarf and some fentanyl, just in case I wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. Nobody laughed. I'm in a room of like 50 people. Nobody laughed, not a single person. And I was like, like i was like what the hell i was cringing so hard because i was like i thought it would get like it's not like the funniest thing in the world but i thought it was like you know everyone's saying serious stuff and then i just say something random you know uh, somebody would be like oh you know just a smile at least and the teacher the dude that was like calling on me and stuff he was just like okay okay it was like one of those what do you call it like um those teachers who were just like dicks and they have to take everything like they have a broom up their ass type of thing one girl to be fair one girl who i was talking to previously who i could see her like cover her mouth and like it was kind of laughing a bit so i'll take that but it was bad dude i didn't belong in the place that's what it was but anyway mental lost mental fantasy fuck so there's this one girl who was you know part of student council at one of the schools but she was kind of like running the whole thing with like the other teachers or people involved and she was good looking dude she was good looking i'll say that she was good looking she she was you know, speaking she was like directing stuff she was you know nice she was like laughing smiling and stuff and she, she was pretty man she was pretty so i was like um oh you know i could ask for a phone number and i was talking to my one friend who like took me there my one friend who's actually on student council and she was saying like oh you know yeah you should go ask her whatever so it was at the end of the whole thing we take a picture outside with all of the people everyone's going home now and she's there talking with a few people and uh you know my heart's kind of beating you know because i wanted to do it for like earlier in the day and stuff but i just you know bitched out you know so my anxiety's getting to me like my heart's pumping i'm kind of like freaking out a bit but then i'm like you know fuck it dude and i start walking to her and once you start making the first the first step forward once you start walking all the anxiety goes you're just you're in the moment so i go up to her i'm like hey uh, your name is blank right like i said her name she was like yeah and i said oh i'm johnny i just wanted to say that i think you're absolutely beautiful and i was wondering if i could get your phone number and then she's like smiling laughing like I, it caught her off guard a bit and then she was like she asked me like what grade I was in. I was like, oh, you know, I mean, but somebody like like interrupted the, the interaction. It was like, oh, can I take a photo with you? And some like random person just completely interrupted it. So she was like, oh, just one second. And then like I'm turning back and like the, the girls that took me there who were actually on student council, they were looking at me like smiling and stuff. But anyways, I get her phone number. I walk out the place. I'm like, once we get behind like some some walls where she can't see, I'm like going to my my friends. I'm like, let's fucking go. Like I'm treating them like they're my boys, you know. I'm like freaking out and stuff. And uh, anyway, we hung out a bit and then went home. And I was doing my workout at home in my home gym. And I just started thinking about her. And I just started thinking about, oh, you know, once I text her, you know, I'll text her tomorrow or something. That I'm gonna you know, ask her out and maybe where can we go? We could go to the beach or something. And I was kind of like visualizing, you know, mentally fantasizing about the date we'd go on, which is something I do like all the time. I kind of have an issue with that. Fantasizing about, you know, an alternate reality, you know, of me being with a girl, going on dates with a girl, and, you know, just anxious attachment style type stuff. So I'm thinking about this date and how it's gonna go with her while I'm, you know, between sets while I'm working out. And then I started thinking lustfully. Then I started thinking sexually. I didn't really realize it until that point. I didn't think, like, lustfully about her at all until that point. You know, I started thinking about, how do I say this, dude? I started thinking about, you know, her and I, uh, Quit glazing the donut is that is that too fucked up to say if she's watching this i'm so sorry i didn't i'm so sorry and then like i think a few days later i texted her i think i was fucking wasted too i was at a i was at a party and i was like asking everybody to help me like send a message because i really didn't want to mess it up because i she was like she was older and she was really pretty and stuff and i just i don't know man but she never texted back man and that freaking hurt because even girls who like just give you the number they'll text you back and be like oh you know and then they'll kind of like beat out around the bush or they'll just you know straight up tell you no um, they'll give you that she didn't even text back and i was like damn one part of what made me feel guilty was that i thought about her lustfully like that when you know, she was like this you know high quality girl like really nice girl was that the reason why she didn't text back because you know god decided to send down to her brain waves that oh don't text this guy back who knows man but probably not there's probably other 
stuff going around, but it was one of my first real experiences of guilt from lusting. And I felt ashamed, man, that I used a girl that I saw as a high quality, you know, like future wife type of girl, that I used her for my own effed up purposes in my head to get a, you know, quick sexual kick. And mental fantasy, it's it's not just that, it's not just a quick kick, it's it's almost an escape, man. At least for me, dude, like I'd be I'd be in math class, like I'd try to be reading, or I'd try to be making food or something, random stuff during my day, and I'd just be going into mental fantasy. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, lustful. It could just be me being with a girl in a relationship or going on a date or, or taking a girl to prom or something like that. I would just like live in that reality. It's like our version of a safe of liberals for, you know? And the question quickly becomes, what am I escaping from? Like what gap am I trying to fill by living in this alternate life? And that can get into some, you know, some dark, you know, childhood trauma, attachment disorder, complex PTSD stuff. You know, why don't I feel like I'm worthy of love in this life? Why do I have to fantasize that I'm you know, worthy of love and a fantasy. And all that stuff is too much to get into in this, you know, video about lust. That, that's all your whole different full guide. If this is a serious thing for you, like if you like can relate to this, then that might be something you want to consider researching on your own. And if you can deal with that root problem, then you can deal with the symptom of that problem, which is lustful fantasy. But some practical things that we can do for overcoming this type of lust, this mental fantasy is progressive deloading. This is like a, a meme with my buddies and stuff. And they see in my video, how to stop effing your socks. And I talk about progressive deloading as one of the things that Hamza talks about for doing no fap. But for this, for mental fantasy, progressive deloading is going from sex fantasies to make out or, you know, like kissing fantasies. You know, bringing it down a level, which it sounds kind of like it's like what the f it's almost kind of crazy to say that it's kind of crazy that we even have to do something like that and that's the best thing that i've kind of come up with and you know the second thing that i'll talk about in a second after this because it's the hardest by far the hardest lust to overcome because you can just do it i can do it right now man i can be talking to you and doing it at the same time you know i'm not gonna be i'm probably gonna be talking some nonsense while i'm doing it but i can do that fapping you know that's an action you have to do and you can take measures to stop yourself from doing that action. It's like a physical action you can do, I should say. And then, you know, looking at girls lustfully, that's a physical action. But mental fantasy, you can be doing freaking anything and fantasizing at the same time. Especially when you're trying to fall asleep at night, man, because it's like, what else do you freaking think about, man? Like, and it's not like it's something you can just quit cold turkey, you know? It doesn't work like that, man. So for mental fantasy, we're gonna have to take the small wins. We're gonna have to look at those and be as grateful as we can for them. Because if we don't, if we say, oh, you know, this is too difficult to overcome, this is it's not worth it, then we stay the way we are, man. And like I said at the beginning of this part of the guide, the more we fantasize in our heads, the more we use girls and lust for girls in our heads mentally, the more we do that in our real life physically. Because your fantasies, they're obsessions. When you have an obsession of, you know, getting your dick sucked or making out with girls or whatever stuff, when you get that opportunity, when that opportunity arises, you don't think you're gonna take it? You've been thinking about it every other night, man, every night. You think you're not gonna take that opportunity? Like you might see it as, oh, well, because I'm not really doing anything, I'm not you know, watching porn, or I'm not you know, doing anything to any girls, I'm not really hurting anybody by thinking in my head. But you're doing reps of lust when you mentally fantasize. In the same way that every morning we do gratitude journaling to do reps of gratitude so that in our daily life, we can just automatically think more gratefully without even having to, to try it just because we've instilled it in us through doing gratitude you know, reps. It's the same thing for lust. We've been doing, when we mentally fantasize, lust reps so that during the rest of our day, during the rest of our daily life, we're more likely to lust because of that. We're more likely to automatically and naturally go to lust. So if we have to take these small wins, if we have to take the small progressions, which is going from, you know, a sex fantasy to a make out fantasy to just, you know, date fantasy or whatever we have to do. If that's what it's gonna take, man, then, then so be it if you ask me, dude. Another thing you can do for mental fantasy is replacement. The hardest type of mental fantasy to overcome is mental fantasy when you're trying to go to sleep. Because you gotta think about something and far too often it's gonna come to something lustful. So while we should be trying to, you know, progressively deload our fantasies to something less and less lustful, we also want to overall, as best we can, try to replace that fantasy. And of course, we won't always be able to do that. That's why we have the slow progression. But when we can, we should try to replace our fantasies with literally freaking anything, dude. It's, it's kind of hard to just prescribe one thing to, to replace your fantasy with, but it's whatever it's gonna, it's whatever is somewhat interesting that's gonna keep you thinking about it. 
Like for me, dude, I just think about random events that I'm gonna plan in the future. Like things that are far away enough where I'm not like feeling anxiety for it, but like, like oh, this summer I wanna do a, you know, a camping with all the boys or something. Like, oh, how are we gonna do that? Like, oh, we're gonna go to the, uh, uh, this provincial park are we gonna go to this campsite what are we gonna bring are we gonna you know kind of do washrooms there like what, what are we like what's the plan type of thing and it's something far away enough because if you do something like oh oh i'm going to a party this sunday it's probably gonna keep you awake more because you know it's coming up in a few days and you you want to figure out a plan what are you gonna do are you gonna talk to girls are you not gonna do are you gonna are you drinking what's going on what's the plan but those future events where it's kind of like blurry you're not really having you don't really have anything finalized yet it's kind of you know out in you know fantasy land then you can you know fantasize about that instead but really at the end of the day it, it like really whatever works for you man it's really whatever works for you whatever you can replace a lost soul fantasy with but try that and see how it goes part four the new life a while back i was brainstorming on this document that's titled the war on lust and i that's where i kept all my research and all my uh, my experiences and all my stuff that I was trying to figure out, my insets and strategies. And I was just brainstorming and I was looking back to this point a bit over a year ago where I was playing football for about four months. The longest I went without, you know, relapsing on no fat. I went four months with like one relapse or something. I was looking back on that and I was like, how did I go that long? How did I do that? And I wrote down this, how did I go four months with one relapse? Well, I was doing football and because of it, I went to bed early every night because I was exhausted. And I was busy all day and I didn't really have the time. It's work. It's doing shit. Living life. If you're sitting at the house all day, eating apples, pacing around your room, sitting in this chair, staring at that wall, that's the perfect time for lust to strike. Because what? Because lust is interesting. It's something to do, man. It's exciting. It's, I guess your blood pumping, you know? When you're not living a life, that's when lust can do the most to you. When you start becoming a busy person, you start living a life, you start doing things, you're going to find yourself busy enough to where it doesn't cross your mind because you have too much shit to do. You're like, oh, I got to finish this and then I got to go to this place. Me and my buddies are doing this and then I got to work on this YouTube or I got to go do, hit this workout. You've got too much on your mind, man. There's no time to, to relapse. I was talking to my buddy at church and uh, I'll talk about this guy in another video. He's, a, he's, the, he's a such a good, nice guy, man. I love this guy. He's a year younger than me, but he's a, he's a real stand-up guy, man. And I'm learning a lot from the guy because I am newly converted. Like, I'm converted like one year ago to Christianity. He kind of grew up in it and then, you know, eventually decided for himself that this is what he believes in. This is what he wants to do. And he's a highly disciplined guy, especially when it comes to things like lust. We've had conversations about it. He's a year younger than me. And it's kind of like, a, like, I'm kind of the, like, what, like, older brother kind of guy in the scenario. I kind of feel like that anyway because I'm like... He's talking to me about what's going on in his life. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's how it goes. But like with school and, and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've been there. But when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to being a biblical man and a follower of Christ and living, you know, free of lust and that kind of stuff, like he's miles past me. So I'm, I'm like listening to him to try to get advice from him. And the other week, one thing he was telling me was that he was uh, going out to play Frisbee golf. And I was like blowing the guy up for it. I'm like, what? Is, or I wasn't making fun of him, but I was like, like what is that? Man? I'm like, what are you talking about? But it's just, uh, like it, it is what it sounds like. It's frisbee, it's golf, but with a frisbee instead. And he was saying how there's these parks around where you can go to, just, you know, buy a disc for a few couple bucks, you know, and then you can go around and, and they got the, you know, all the holes and all the flags for all the spots and stuff. And I was talking to him and he was saying the reason why he's uh, doing that was because cause he's trying to stay away from just loitering around, you know, because that's when temptation comes in to get him. That's what he said. And he's absolutely right, man. He's getting out of the house. He's doing something physical, doing something... Uh, I don't know, would you call it exercise, man? Frisbee golf? I mean, I guess you're walking around and stuff, but he's getting fresh air. He's, he's doing something positive, getting social, getting outside the house, doing something, you know, in the fresh air, in the grass, you know, and he's staying away from boredom. He's staying away from, he's staying away from laziness because that's when sin comes to, that's when sin comes knocking on the door. And of course, this is not something you can just implement right now. Oh, start living a life. Start, let me just punch in a bunch, like a dozen things in my schedule for the week. But it is something you should have at, as your end goal when it comes to lust. But it is the ideal, it's what we're trying to reach here. Like we're not trying to live a life where our entire life is just, you know, prevent and prepare, uh, you know, eye contact and, uh, you know, replacing mental fantasy. We're not trying to have our whole life be that, man. Our end goal, like of course, for now, when we're trying to overcome it, like that's what we're gonna be doing. But the end goal is that we're on the other side of the wall. That lust doesn't even cross our mind. That's what uh, Hamza said that once before that, the ideal for nofap the ideal end result is 
you don't even think about porn anymore. It doesn't even cross your mind. Like that's how far removed you are from it. And I think it's the same thing for lust. Like that's the, the goal to be so far removed from lust that it doesn't even cross our mind. And yeah, of course, you know, we're just gonna have to fight battles and stuff, but, but in our life as a whole, we're so busy, we're doing other things. And you know, we've had the, the practice and the experience and made the progress where we can now live a, like a life without dealing with that to, you know, the degree we did before. That's something you should keep in mind, I think. We, we don't wanna be cooped up in the house, you know, like cradling in like fetal position, just recanting uh, anti-lust strategies to ourselves. We wanna be living a life, man. My final words for this guide. Ah, oh, I've been filming for like a long time, dude. My final words for this guide. It's never too late for redemption. Don't be afraid to give up the good for the great. Peace out.